uh, we are starting out with our, our prototyping user user testing session. So um, I want to throw it over to our team uh, to introduce yourselves. Uh, let me know what's your name, where are you coming from, and what is your role at Figma? So I will throw it over to you, Anna, to start, and then we'll go Nico and Garrett. Yeah, awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning into our live stream. I'm Anna. I'm a designer advocate at Figma. And yeah, excited to share some prototyping tips and tricks with y'all. Awesome. Uh, maybe Nico can go next. What up? Nico here. Um, yeah, product designer. I've been working on prototyping for a while now. And um, yeah, excited to, to, to dive into this. Uh, over to Garrett and this little head over there. <laughs> yes, hello everyone. I'm Garrett. I'm out here in North Carolina. I saw that I saw a few other folks that are um, from nearby here, here with my daughter for the beginning of the uh, session today. I'm the product manager uh, for prototyping. I'm really excited to get into it with everyone. Amazing. We have our, our tiniest PM slash designer joining us. I love it. <laughs> awesome. So kind of the way this is going to go today is we've got a bundle. You can see here, we've got a bundle of pre-made questions here. Um, these all came in either from social. We had a ton come in from social, which was awesome on our Instagram. Um, we also kind of gathered all the questions that we get asked a lot. Um, any questions we've gotten from customers in the last, whoop, sorry, my chair just <laughs> Let's know. Um, any questions that we've had from uh, customers in the last couple of weeks, um, we brought those all in here. But also, we uh, we definitely. Uh, uh, we definitely want to make sure that we get your questions live. So go ahead. I see there's a couple in the Q&A already. That's amazing. Feel free to start getting those in there as we get started. Um, and let's go. So we are going to start off with Nico. So Nico, you can go ahead and take over the screen share and just kind of tell us how do I, oh, actually one more thing before we start. Um, we're definitely going to talk about variables here. I, a lot of amazing things came out with variables and prototyping, but I also like to remind folks that there was a world before variables too, like, and you can do so many great things in prototyping without them. So we're going to kind of split the session in half. First half, we're going to talk about um, what you can do in prototyping and user testing and all of that without even touching variables. Um, and then going into variable second half. So uh, starting out with just like the basics, if you're very new at prototyping, you're like, I know this can help me, but how, um, where do I even start? Uh, Nico, we're gonna go over to you for this one. Yes, 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 okay, okay. Sharing my screen, just gonna be sure I share the right one. Perfect. Sweet, okay, how can I start up with a basic prototype? Um, yeah, I think overall, I think there's a couple of different ways of, of, of approaching this. So in, on, on one hand, of course, you might say, oh, I'm building out the prototype as I'm going along, as I'm kind of like wireframing, I'm always prototyping. But often you end up with a couple of screens you have already, right? You have a couple of screens and you're like, oh, I want to prototype this now. And um, so the first thing is that while you're in the design tab, um, there's really no way to like create a prototype. So you have to go over here to the right and click on this prototype button. Once you're in the prototype button, you're in essentially the prototype mode that the uh, that the editor is in. At that point, one thing has changed. You'll see this like a little circular node here. Like, yes, you get a different properties panel, but like most of your interactions will be happening directly on the canvas over here. And um, what you can do with this is essentially that like, right, you you might might talk to uh, talk to an engineer or a PM and say, oh, when you click on this, then go over here. And this is exactly the kind of information you want to add in a prototype. So let's click on the prototype here and say, let's say, see what's hot. Yes, this goes over here. So you take this little circular node over here and you basically just drag that circular node onto the next frame. What then happens is that uh, we open this little thing here on the canvas. What this actually is, is if you look over here on the right, you see that there's an interaction now set up that says on click, navigate to purchase 200. Uh, with an instant and state management options. I'm not going to talk about the state management options right now, just kind of like on the ones above. Um, purchase two, that's a list of all your frames inside of uh, uh, the page here. And then instant is the uh, option of a couple of different animations here. And so one thing I want to show is basically just uh, a, uh, a simple animation. What I just did here, I'll talk about the shortcut here, is I opened the inline preview. The inline preview is a way for me to really quickly kind of like yeah, test out uh, a little interactions that I've set up. 
So in this case here, I click on what, see what's hot and go over here. So let's do this. Okay, now I'm over here. We see it indicates this a little bit. And let's maybe click at the bottom here to go back for now. Right. So now we can go on shop and we can click on see what's hot to go over here. Sweet. But we want to have a little animation. So one of the animations that we can do here, I think that fits quite well, is um, tup, tup, tup. yeah, slide in. I think slide in could work well for this one here because it's kind of like you go to the right of the app. So going to the right makes sense. But as you can see here, if you actually look more closely on this, you see that this whole tab bar kind of like navigates over as well. So if you check this button here, animate mapping layers, it will now, should, uh, it should now animate like whatever is happening inside that layer and keep that persistent. So now you've created a super simple interaction and you would basically just continue with this. Um, one thing to call out is essentially that like, if you have a local component like a nav bar here, you can just link from a button like this component here to the what's hot page and from this other button to the shop page. Let's go over here and do this. And now you already kind of like have this set up for every interaction where you want to play with this. Um, the only other thing I want to show you for this just super basic prototyping case is um, overlays. So if I link to this frame here, it defaults to navigate to. But if we look at this one here, that's actually not what we want, right? So if I click on add to basket, we don't want to see this entire thing, right? We want it to come up from the bottom and act, act as like a sheet at the bottom. So that is essentially the difference between a navigate to and an open overlay interaction. So open overlay allows you to put this yeah, on top of everything you see right now. So now this happened instantly without an animation. And so we want to adjust this a little bit. We want to say this is bottom center. Yes, that's correct. But we don't want it to be instant. We want it to be moving in from the bottom. Okay, so let's try this out. Perfect. I can't close this when clicking outside. So I'm just going to check this button. Close when clicking outside. And now I can see that like I can click on this and I'm opening this. I can click back at the top and yeah, close the overlay. And essentially, that's it. You connect a couple of screens together and you can make them experienceable. Um, but there's a lot more to it. So back to you. Awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah, there's so many things I feel like you can do in it. Um, but that's a really great way to kind of just get started and and figure out your way, your way in. Um, I'm going to go over to Anna now. Um, Somebody asked this question live of how do you do remote testing successfully? And also just kind of like tips in general, once you have, once you have some prototypes set up, uh, I'd love to hear any tips that you have for user testing. Yeah, definitely. Let me go ahead and share my screen so we can kind of talk through this. So um, first of all, for just presenting in general um, in Figma, like prototyping is a really great way to do that. So some people will have full slide presentations or if you want to do any kind of user testing as well, um, using Figma prototyping capabilities is incredibly helpful. Um, for the context of user testing, I would say some of my main tips uh, would be first of all to organize your um, different prototypes into separate flows. So if I go into the prototype tab, um, you can see we have a couple of different flows here. So I have one for this recipe picker and then one for the shop flow. And to create a new flow starting point, so I could have it begin at the very beginning of my prototype, or if you potentially have different flows that will merge into each other, or you want someone to be able to start from maybe some kind of midpoint, just select the specific frame that you want to do that. And then with flow starting point, you just click the plus button and then you can give that a name. So maybe I'll just call that um, like tomato description. And when I go to present, uh, if we look at the side panel, you can see tomato description shows up here. And basically you can kind of switch between um, each of my different prototypes um, just by clicking on these different flows. So I think that's the first thing if you have potentially like A-B tests, so you wanna test out some different designs or iterations, or if you want um, whoever is participating in your user research to kind of go through multiple different flows, you can organize them this way. 
Another thing that's really helpful for that is using your flow descriptions to provide some kind of additional guidance. So usually you probably um, have some kinds of instructions that you want to give them, especially if you're uh, maybe not doing this live, if you're doing this like async. Um, and so you can add your descriptions by if I click to edit the description, you'll see here I have put in some examples. So maybe you want them to perform specific tasks within the flow. So maybe in the context of the shop, like I want them to make sure that they add items to the basket. I want them to click and view a description for an item. And I want them to also go to checkout. And then here I have some guidance too. So like once they're complete with this, go to the recipe picker prototype so they can move on to the next step. So yeah, you can add descriptions. Um, there's a couple of things you can do as well, like putting in a bulleted or numbered format. Um, you could link to other stuff. If there's any other kinds of files that you want the person to go to, um, you can definitely do that. And when they're in the present mode, they'll be able to see those descriptions. So for instance, here I can see, I'm just gonna be able to view all of the guidance um, within this side panel here. So that's kind of how you can try to organize your prototypes when you share it with other people. Um, also when you're sharing for user testing, so you can uh, set certain kinds of restrictions for that. So um, if I go to share here, um, I can set to maybe anyone if I want to be able to invite people that aren't in my organization. And then I can set a password as well, and as well as a duration. So. If you wanna make sure that maybe um, for security reasons, uh, people aren't able to continue accessing a prototype after the user testing session, you can configure this um, by setting up that time duration. And then also to add extra security, being able to automatically generate these passwords is incredibly helpful. And also while you're doing your prototyping session, so you could definitely have them share their screen via Zoom, um, but similar to how you can follow people within like a Figma file. So for instance, like I'm following Lauren right now within our main Figma design presentation file, you can do the exact same thing with a prototype. So as long as both you, the person who are conducting the user testing session, and the participant who's going through your flow, as long as you're in that same prototype, you can actually follow them and see kind of what they're doing, maybe what are certain screens that they're stuck on, um, or if there's certain like unexpected um, interactions that they're trying to do, you, you're able to actually observe that. So that can kind of probably help with the person's question earlier about maybe the Zoom interface being a little distracting. Um, they can kind of just focus in on the file while doing it, not have to share their screen. So. That's to kind of help with conducting sessions. We also have some different um, integrations. I would definitely recommend you check out. So we've got integrations with Sprig, Maze, and user testing. So those definitely add additional functionalities that Figma doesn't currently support that are very specific to user testing. So I definitely recommend that uh, if you want to be able to do more with that, check out those integrations. Um, and then with also a point on running your uh, prototype. Some other things you can do to make it easier for people to interact with it um, would be to maybe add a certain level of fidelity. So for instance, going into your prototype settings and adding a device. So this will kind of like help it feel a little more realistic to your user, even if maybe they're not, you know, pulling it up on their phone, if they don't have the Figma app, um, if they're just viewing in the browser, still kind of clarifying to them that this is a maybe mobile app experience. So there's a bunch of different devices you can choose from. In this case, I would choose the iPhone 13 mini. And so now you can see when I'm in the prototype, oh, I can scroll and I can see the device context. And then some other things that you can do as well is if you click on options, um, I can uh, configure some things such as to show hotspots. So if you kind of feel like people need a bit of a hint on where to interact with, you can provide hotspots so you can see anything that's kind of blue is something that I can interact with. Um, or if you would rather like just see how people are trying to test out and interact with it, you can always choose to hide that as well. And then also choose to like show or hide the Figma UI as well, if you wanna make sure that they're focusing on the actual prototype itself. So 
yeah, that's some tips on conducting user testing within Figma. And then another thing for presentations too, is if you have like a prototype, so I have this full shop flow here. Um, if you want to present your designs, like in some kind of like design review or all hands, uh, you could actually embed a prototype within a prototype slide. So almost like a certain level of inception. And if I play this slide, um, because I have this other prototype built in, you know, people could interact with this presentation. Oh, let me remove the device size because otherwise it's not gonna show my full thing. You can see I have like my slide, maybe I wanna add some like bullet points describing my design and you're still able to view it and fit it within the context of like a slide, but still be able to scroll and see everything um, that would be in the screen. So yeah, that's a couple of different tips. Um, maybe moving on to the next question. Cool, amazing. That was really great. A lot of great tips there. Um, for the next one, I'm going to go to Garrett. I saw one of these questions come in through the Q&A. A couple of these questions came in um, via our social. Um, and the question is basically around Smart Animate. Um, and the problem is that a lot of times with Smart Animate, it can be really, really powerful, but you have to set it up a very specific way. Um, so the real question kind of comes to why is naming so important in Smart Animate? Can you show us that, Garrett? Absolutely. So we have a nice little demo set up for everyone here. Um, and then we'll walk through some examples of how it applies. But the magic of Smart Animate really comes down to the name of the layers themselves. So when you do, when you are Smart Animating between frames, as we have here, you can see that whenever I click anywhere in this frame, I want to Smart Animate over to screen two here. Um, and what that means is it's going to look for any matching shapes within it and make and try to animate them. So right now, these shapes are named differently. This one is named Rectangle. And this one is named circle up here. So when I click, it just does a basic fade through. It's like, I don't know what these things are. They don't mean anything to me. So I'll just switch between them. But over here, we've named both of them the same. They're both named shape. And what this is doing is telling Smart Animate, hey, these two are technically the same object. So in whatever way you can transition between these. And as you can see, it changes the shape, it fades, and it changes the color over time. So it has a much more natural gradient. Um, this is a very basic example of kind of the structure there. but what you can do is you can start applying more places. So things that you don't want to animate or you want to um, disappear, you can make, name differently. And things that you want to match or animate, you can name the same. So we have a music player here. And basically I want, uh, when the user clicks onto this, uh, onto this little nav bar down here, I want it to expand and for all the objects within it to animate really nicely. And everything else should just stay static. So I'll click here, move this over here. Okay, where do I click? Right there. And look, just like that, all of these little pieces um, kind of move to where move to their new locations because this this node right here and this one are the same. This image right here and this image right here are the same. So it's doing its best to animate everything in between there. And you can you can keep pushing on this too. So here we have a nav bar where all of these objects at the top are all named um, identically. This is a header. This is a nav bar, and there's a little highlight right there. And so all of these items technically match across all these frames. And each of these is different. The, these are list items. These are gallery um, image placeholders. And these are charts. Um, and right here, we have an interaction set up between each of these tabs that I want to navigate to the appropriate tab. And I want to use the push animation. I also have this checkbox here that says animate the matching layers. So it says, whatever, you know, when you navigate between these frames, um, do your best to smart animate between anything that has the same name. So as I click through these things, you can see that they get pushed out because these don't match in the second frame. So they're out of here but everything else kind of continues on, including this highlight, which is technically named the same, it's pushing in the same way. It's pushing along and trying to push to its new location right there. So that's a really quick example of Smart Animate and just the power is really in how you um, how you name things and where you locate them within these different frames. Awesome. Uh, I learned this one way too late in life. I was, I, I think I learned it like my first week at Figma. Um, and I was like a very avid Figma user before that. Um, and it changed my life. <laughs> so very exciting. Everybody needs to know about that. Um, cool. We are going over to Nico for the next one. I'm going to kind of combine two of them. Um, one of them is uh, shortcuts. What shortcuts to use? Because those are a game changer in life. Um, and maybe you can show some of those shortcuts you use while you're talking about sections in prototyping, there was a question came in about um, linking a nav bar to local components. Uh, we might do something like this when talking about uh, sections or a little bit more of kind of getting into the details of how sections can be really helpful in prototyping. Yes, of course. Okay. 
So I'm going to share my screen. Du, 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 du. Cool. So the first thing here, here's a kind of like a, a good overview of our shortcuts, right? Um, so we have open the design panel, which is option eight, and option uh, nine is opening the prototype panel. So I'm clicking up, I'm holding option and clicking eight and nine to switch between those. It's not my favorite shortcut because it's actually really hard to click, essentially, like if, especially if you have one hand on the mouse. Um, it's not really a good left-handed shortcut, which is why one of my favorite shortcuts is the Shift E shortcut. So what Shift E does is it's basically similar to like option eight and option nine, um, but we added it much later. Option eight and option nine, uh, I think we had option zero as well for some point. Um, they're really old shortcuts. They've been there for like six six years ish. Um, but Shift E is relatively new, maybe like two years, two years. And what this does, it essentially it toggles between the design and the prototype tab. So as you can see here, I can use my mouse over here and I can switch between. And so where this is really helpful, just as an example is, let's say we look at this thing here, right? And we want to see the interactions and we see a couple of interactions and then we click on some of those and uh, maybe it goes in the way. I can, while I'm zooming in, just hit Shift E, turn off the interactions. If I want to kind of create a new interactions over here, I hit Shift E, to go into the prototype mode without moving my mouse back and forth. So the key part really is that like I can use the shortcut while my mouse stays in the context of where I'm editing. So that's Shift E, absolutely my favorite shortcut. Um, next one is present. If you hit Option, Command, and Enter, you are going to do the same thing that you do when you click the Play button up here, which is opening a new tab and opening the viewer in the new tab. Um, I feel like this one is less fast necessarily because like you know you're already switching contexts quite heavily with the shortcut um but preview one that one is another one of my favorites because preview one is the one that i do to open this little window over here right so let's click kind of like take a look here right so dup, 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 we can click on niggy and we can close it and we can click on anthony and so we go back and forth and say if if this is kind of like much bigger right or it's in the center hitting shift space allows us to kind of like really quickly try out something, change something, try out something again. So that's shift space. Also, really like this, really use it day to day. Um, two other things, um, deep select by holding command, you can click something and it, no matter how deeply nested it is, you can use it and select text, which is like if you have, if you have your cursor, uh, your text tool selected, clicking anywhere where it is the text, you immediately start entering that. Um, I do have one more. I want to add that's a, it's a little it's a little favorite pick and um we call it like maybe float layer i'm actually not sure if we have like a normal one to this uh, let me just make this a little bigger wait okay so float layer right so we are in a frame here and let's say we have this rectangle and this rectangle is in this frame so you can see it's nested in this frame but i actually want this to be kind of like behind the frame so i can animate in, in the next frame um, and so what I can do is I can hold this, I can click down, I hold the space bar, and now I can move this without it. You can see it's not nesting outside. So if I turn this frame into the dip, 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 content, I can click on the subject, I can hold space bar before I start dragging, and now it's going to stay within this, and it's not like nested outside of this. So I can move it to a space outside and then duplicate this whole frame, select this object again, and then move it in. So that's a way to kind of like override the automatic nesting behavior. I think it's super helpful as well. So yeah, you asked me about sections. Where is the sections here? Yeah, let's talk about this one. So if you think about this, let's actually move this really quickly to this one and let's move the... So if you know how stories work, right? Normally you'd say like, if I click on Miggy story and I look at all these beautiful dogs, right? Um, and I close this and I open Miggy's story again. Where would I land? If I've seen the story, why would I see the story again from the beginning, right? See all those dogs again. And I love dogs. Beautiful. But like, why do I always see those dogs, right? And let's see how this works with Anthony's gallery here. So here, Anthony like shows cats. I like dogs a little bit more than cats. No, no, no harm to all the, all the cat people out there. Um, but the cool thing here is that say we wait on this on this beautiful brown cat here, right? And we uh, close this or like this one, the thing down here. 
Now, when I click on Anthony, I'm actually continuing at the cat that I left it at, which is cool. It's cool, but how does this work, right? There's no, there's no complex conditional logic here. It simply is the use of sections. So let's actually change the color of this a little bit so we can actually see the noodles that are on it here. Um, so what you can see here is that this noodle going out from Miggy's head goes to this frame. So it'll always land and start this, set, this behavior at that particular frame. So that's exactly what happens here, right? I click on I click on Miggy and I open with this photo. No matter where I go here, I will, I will if I close here and I go back, it's following exactly this interaction and it goes back to this. But if we look at Anthony's here, this one is actually set up slightly different. It doesn't go to any one particular frame here. It goes to the section. So a section is a thing. It's a container essentially that uh, we've originally added in FigJam, but then realized it has like cool uses to in, in, in Figma. And you can get to a section if you go to frame and click on section or shift S as the shortcut. And so let's do the same thing over here um, with Miggy. So as you can see, we can sections can be a target to link to. And what this does is if you open this now and you click on Miggy and you go to this beautiful dog and we close it, this interaction now, if I follow this again, will open the last visited frame in this section. Now, if I click on this, you see the green dog. And that's how sections help you with essentially like local state management in a much more efficient way. Uh, other ways to use this is like in a tab bar navigation um, or in um, like in a tab bar over here where I have this local component here for the nav bar. Right now, this nav bar links to this first frame here, right? If we link this nav bar to this, this frame here, then no matter where in the checkout state I am, if I go to a tab and go to a different tab, it'll reopen in the context of where that where that part of the prototype was. Um, also really helpful if you have like uh, uh, an app with like lots of different sections. Uh, I can't use the word sections for like explaining what sections do, but like a lot of different like sub apps in it. Uh, that'll be helpful as well in that context. So yeah, that's how sections and combined with local components work. Amazing. That was a, that was a game changer once I realized that. Um... Awesome, cool. We're gonna do one more without variables and then we're gonna dive into variables. So for this last one, um, and then we can always go back if we've got some more time too. Uh, last one, there was a couple questions I saw in the chat about scrolling behavior. Um, so we're gonna go to Anna for scrolling. There was also a question I saw about, um, does auto layout, uh, having your stuff auto layout, does that change anything? Um, I think Anna will be able to show us one thing that you will need to take the auto layout off of if you're doing some sticky scroll, um, but let's go to Anna for scrolling behavior. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so to implement scrolling within a Figma prototype, um, the main thing that you need to make sure is that the content is going to fall outside of the frame that it lives in. So right now I've got kind of a frame where maybe I want some like scrollable carousels and then maybe some like additional content as well. Um, if I kind of just look at how this plays out without doing anything, uh, you're going to notice that you know, everything is just kind of static. There isn't really any kind of scrolling. I am scrolling down just because my actual frame size is bigger than what I'm displaying right now on my computer. So let's go ahead and do some frame resizing so that we can actually implement the scroll. So first of all, I'm going to command and resize my frame so that um, it is cutting off some of the content here and then make sure to click this checkbox, clip content. Um, also for each individual horizontal carousel, I wanna make sure I'm also resizing those frames as well, just to make sure that the content is also um, going to be scrollable. So let's resize that. So it only goes to the edge here. And now if we go to the prototyping tab, I'm gonna click on each of these frames and let's set the overflow to horizontal for these two carousels. And then let's set for this larger section below here. Um, let's make that um, vertical. And if we go back and refresh this prototype. Oh, let's go. I lost my place here, so let's re redo that. Okay. So, okay, I'm scrolling. I've got this weird thing here where 
this navigation is moving as well. But you can see it's kind of starting to work a little bit. We've got a bit of scrolling behavior, but now we want to kind of clean it up. So first of all, with the navigation, um, I want to exempt that from the scrolling behavior. So I'm going to position that as instead of scroll with parent, um, let's make that fixed. So it's kind of the three different options you have is scroll with parent, fixed, and sticky. And then you can also choose the default overflow behavior for each frame. So I'm gonna make that stick in place because I wanna keep that at the bottom. And then also for these different carousels, um, I also have these headers that are moving. I wanna make those sticky as well because I don't want the headers to move. I just want these little card content that I have. And then also I wanna add some additional padding here just so that I can actually add a little bit of extra space and not just kind of end right where each of these little cards ends. So to do that, let's first select these headers Let's set those to fixed. And then for each of these, um, just so I can add some of that extra padding, um, I nested the actual scrollable content into their own frame. And then I'm just going to manually extend that. So I'll do that for both of these, just manually extend. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. Ideally though, you probably have some kind of specific padding value. And then let's just do it for the bottom here because I don't want the last rectangle to be hidden by the navigation. Um, I want that to actually go beyond. So let's first make sure it is the height. Um, also with scrolling, because things have to fall outside of the frame, it's kind of hard to edit things if you can't actually see the content. So you can also do shift O as the shortcut to access outline mode. So I can see, okay, here's all of like this, these different rectangles I wanna scroll past. And then I'm gonna drag the frame to be approximately larger than the height of this navigation so I can make sure I can still see that last rectangle element as I'm scrolling. So outline mode is super helpful whenever you're making any kind of scrolling content. And then I'm gonna hit shift O again, just to uh, exit that mode. Hey Anna. If we go back to our prototype. Can you, oh, also, yeah. can you also show us where clip content is? There's some folks asking about how to see oh, yeah. uh, the content outside. Yeah, so um, clip content is just this little checkbox here. Um, so yeah, you can select that. Um, because I already have it applied to the larger frame, that's why I don't need to do it for all these nested layers. But yeah, if I were to not have that, that's also another way in which you can see your content. But um, make sure that you clip it so that you can actually do the scrolling behavior. So, okay, we've got the header sticking we can scroll the carousels and there's some extra padding here. And then, whoa, looks like we need to make sure that we are setting the overflow behavior vertical. And let's go ahead and, ah, the problem here is I resized the wrong frame. So I wanna actually make sure that the nested one is the one where I'm adding that extra space. And then the frame that is scrolling here. We actually need to make sure that that is smaller so that I can have that overflow behavior. Okay. Whoa. Let's replay it. I think I broke something. And this is, Anna's doing a really awesome job of troubleshooting live. I feel <laughs> like so many times with prototyping. Um, this is why like the okay. inline prototype too can come in really helpful as to a lot of troubleshooting um, as to kind of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I think I must have set up something wrong with one of my scrolls. Let's see, the navigation's fixed and then everything else is scrolling. Um, I'm not sure what I did, but I also wanna make sure that we can move on to sticky, but totally. general sense is make sure you add extra padding um, in your frames, make sure that you're clipping the content. You can only scroll content that goes beyond the bounds of the frame that it's in. Um, and then the different configurations can be fixed, scroll with parent or sticky. Um, for sticky scroll, that allows you to essentially have any element stick to the top of a frame as you're scrolling past it. So in this example, floating here, if we don't have sticky scroll, so everything's just going to scroll uh, in and then outside of the bounds of the frame. If we had sticky scroll for this navigation, you can see it's just going to stick to the top and everything else is going to scroll past it. And then it'll go back to the default state. So to do that, um, it's just that same configuration that you see when we're setting up um, the positioning. So instead of scrolled with parent, just go ahead and change that to sticky. 
and that will allow that to work. And then you can apply sticky scrolling to a variety of things. So you can think about navigations, um, search bars, even for like different tables, for example, um, you could have the headers be sticky for a table if someone's scrolling through it. So let this load. So you can have scrolling in different directions, but still seeing the headers. And then you can even have different sections with their own configurations. Like everything, all of your scroll interactions are gonna be based on um, per frame basis. So this is how you can kind of customize things. Um, one important thing to note though with scrolling is to also um, try to keep in mind the order of your frames. So if you have something sticking at the top, um, make sure that that is going to fall um, in terms of layer orders above the other content because otherwise the other content will overlap on top of it. Um, and then also because of the layer ordering, um, it does not really work well with auto layout just because you can't really separate the positioning um, and make that unique for each individual sticky element um, separate from the other content that's in the auto layout frame. So that's another thing to consider. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like a quick lowdown on scrolling. Amazing. That was great. Um, I'm actually going to stick with you, Anna, on this one. We're, we're moseying on over to um, variables. There was a question that came in um, about uh, kind of like, I have a lot of screens. Can I reduce the amount of screens? And I think variables is going to be key for that. Um, so Anna, uh, I'm wondering if you can just give us kind of like a quick summary. I think a lot of folks are like, w it's overwhelming, myself included, when I first got to variables, it's very overwhelming to figure out why do I use these? Where can they be used in prototyping? Um, there's a really fun example that I think you have uh, of showing what, how can variables be helpful? Yeah, definitely. So let me share my screen once again. So for quick context, um, variables essentially allow you to store the values of certain things within your design. Um, you'll probably have heard a lot of people using it in the context of design systems, using variables to ensure consistency across your designs, but you can also use them in prototyping as well. And so kind of for prototyping, the main advantage for variables is just the amount of repetition um, that you don't have to do when you're using it. So kind of in like the old way in which you would uh, prototype. So in this example here, we have sort of like a click through process where you select some maybe like different ingredients, and then you want to see what are the different possible recipes you can have. Uh, so depending on which things a person selects, that's going to give you some different options. Before we had variables, and so before we had the ability to be able to store that kind of information, you had to essentially build out every single possible permutation. And so this causes you to have a lot of duplicate screens. So each of these are essentially copy and pasted, but just making some kind of like small adjustment to it. Um, and you had to essentially build that out in order to have a prototype that feels realistic and allows users to be able to go through every single possible path. But when you're using variables, you can actually store information such as okay, what are the different options that the person selected? And when they click on a button, okay, you can say, all right, they selected watermelon or they selected kale. Um, and you can have that logic influence then um, what kind of information is going to be displayed. So instead of having all these duplicates for choose a category, choose the item, and then show the recipes, um, you can just have one of each of these, and then you can change what kind of information is going to be populated to them based on decisions that your user made earlier on. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of like the basics of, you know, why variables are valuable and with variables, which I believe Nico and Garrett are going to talk about later, like you can do a lot of things too, like such as um, having like expressions and conditionals to actually implement the logic um, and dynamically change the kinds of things that you're seeing as you're traversing through a prototype. Amazing. Um, yeah, we call all those little things noodles internally and no more noodle soup. No more, everyone. <laughs> Cool. Um, I am going to go to Garrett next. Um, so I was asking um, all of our, our prototype extraordinaires, um, I was asking them about what kind of, what is their favorite way to use variables? Um, and Garrett was saying that he finds it most useful in variant binding. Um, and I had to ask, please tell me what that means. Um, so Garrett, to you, what is variant binding in advanced prototyping? And when would you use it? 
Absolutely. Um, thanks. So this is my favorite feature. It's also one of our um, most complex and complicated ones. So I just wanted to call that out. Um, a great way to get introduced to especially variant binding and to walk through variables yourselves is to go through our advanced prototyping play, uh, advanced prototyping playground that we put together uh, and worked hard on this. And it's very, very useful for kind of walking through these use cases yourself and really internalizing it. I'll show you a little bit of how it works, but um, I myself even found it easiest to uh, learn by getting into these prototypes and breaking them myself. So variant binding is basically the idea that you can create a variable that can hold the state of a component. So you can use a component, which has, in this case, here's one that we've created, um, which is called shape image. And it has these three different variants. It has um, a circle, a diamond, and a star. And they're all named accordingly. Um, and I've got an instance of that component right over here. You can see shape image and over here, um, do, 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 do. it's actually bound to a variable right now. And so what this means is that whenever I change this shape variable, um, it will update to the appropriate, uh, to the appropriate uh, instance. And so in this case, I have a string that's holding the value and the string can either be circle, diamond, or um, let me pull up the variable right now. This, this can either be a uh, circle, diamond or star. And then in over down here, each one of these buttons can set that variable here. So I'll turn on prototyping mode. I pushed shift D to do that. And you can see it sets variable, the shape to circle. This one over here is saying set it to diamond. And this one right here is saying set it to star. And this is bound to that same variable. When I click here and I go through, what it's doing is when I click on this, it's saying set the shape variable to diamond. And then this instance, which is bound to that variable is updating. And the reason this is really powerful is because now suddenly you can use components to actually hold states of things. So you can imagine this being really useful if you have like a tab bar or a nav bar. We want to um, you want to organize certain pages that are that are similar in different ways, or just keep your file a little bit tidier after you've created this big noodle mess. And variant and variable binding are one of the best ways to do that. Um, we can just kind of do it together over here really quick too, just to kind of uh, double tap on like what it's like to actually use this. So similar concept, I have a plant image over here and it has um, Monstera, appropriately a fig, and then the ZZ plant. If you have any plant questions, please feel free to direct them at Nico. He is our resident expert. He loves talking about plants. Um, and right here, I have an instance of that component, but right now it's not actually bound to anything. You can see I can change it to Monstera and it changes to that, uh, to that variant. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over here I'm going to bind to this plant variable that I created, this string. And that is right here. It says this plant variable is named Monstera. And actually, because this is now bound, if I change this to fig, this updates in real time too. So it's bound to this variable, this, this, um, it, which means it will look for the name of any instance matching this string value. Um, and in this case, I have these three buttons and I want I want clicking these to actually update that variable type. So I'll go over here. I'm going to click on this first button. I'm going to add an interaction. I'm going to set variable. Get my plant variable. And I'll say it needs to be set to Monstera. And I've done the same for each of these. You can see this says set variable plant to fig. Set variable plant to ZZ, which again is matching the actual instance, uh, the variant name over here. So I'm going to click here. I can go through and it's updating real time. So it's just swapping instances between these different cases. Um, you can use this in a lot of different ways and build uh, really amazing like interactive components that kind of that navigate through and hold that state themselves and then bind variants to that. So our playground goes through those. I didn't want to do that live because I find it gets a little bit lost, um, but please check that out, play with them yourselves, try to break the playground and try to fix it again. I find it's really useful for understanding these concepts. Amazing, cool. Um, there's so many questions that even I have myself that are and a lot that are coming in. I think we have time for like two more. Um, I'm going to go to Nico for just conditional logic. There was a lot that came in on um, Instagram of how does conditional logic work? And then I'm going to if we have time, I want to go back over to Garrett for some troubleshooting because there's folks asking about some some troubleshooting questions um, and you have a really great way to do that. So over to Nico about conditional logic. How does that work? Conditional logic, okay. So the thing we're gonna do here, we have this little prototype and I already set up a two variables, here, right? So let's open the variable panel. I have um, error as a Boolean variable and I have count as the number. And if I click on this one, the count goes up. If 
and click one of the counters down. What we want to do now is show the error message. This thing here, right? This thing only when the error is like when it's below zero, so when it's true. So the first thing we got to do is bind this Boolean value that we just have, the local variables one, this one, right? Bind this one to this error field. So this is a little hidden, but if you right click on the layer I icon over here, at some point we'll find it there and you're going through this, I promise. Uh, if you right click on this and you click on, you pick error false, then it's hidden because right now it's false. If I set this to true, it's going to be visible in both places. This is a little bit slightly delayed just because it's the inline preview. And so now we need to make this happen whenever it goes below zero and turn it back off whenever it is above zero. And so the way we do this is we go into here using shift E, my favorite shortcut in the world to go into the prototype tab and then go to this one here. And so the thing we got to use here is a conditional. So we're going to click on conditional and we say if count is below zero, right? Then we want to set the variable error to true. And now we do the same thing here, set the variable error. Oh, let me scroll down a little. Error to false, right? And so now what we're doing is when the count goes below zero, then the error is set to true. Otherwise, the error is set to false. So, dip, dip, dip. Ah, error is shown. It doesn't go away, though. It goes away when I click minus once because we don't have that conditional logic yet uh, in this other place. We could move this around and check this before we do the set variable, but it makes sense to check this after the set variable. Um, we will, at some point, allow you to select this and copy and paste this. But for now, I'm just going to recreate this really quickly over here and say, OK, if count is bigger than 0, then set the variable error to false. Otherwise, set the variable error to true. And now we have it, and it should work. And there we go. Simple conditional logic to show and hide a, a, a object. You can change any variable here. You could even like move this around to this other uh, conditional and move this around and yeah. Play with us. Sweet. Awesome. Cool. OK, I think we have the time for the one more, the troubleshooting one, Garrett. Um, this one you explained to me and was really, really helpful. So I want you to explain it to the world. <laughs> yes. So uh, one of the things you run into when you're using variables is you're updating these. Um, you're updating this variable. Here I have an example in here. And what I it's a very basic example. I have this rectangle. And it's got a, um, a border radius variable bound to it. Right now it's set to 5 which you can see right here. Um, and these two buttons just increase it by five or decrease it by five. And so um, say I'm updating here and I'm like, man, I really wish I knew what it was because it's not actually updating or showing me anything in the variable modal. It's only updating it in the prototyping state. And so while we do have ideas and long-term plans for improving this debugging experience overall, one of the things that you can do right now is create a little variable right here, a little string, sorry, create a string element. Go over here to the variable binding, click that. And now it actually tells me what the border radius is. So it's reflecting the current value of this. If I change this to 50, you'll see that updates there. And it also updates the border radius there. And when I play this, it'll actually tell, show me the number. So this is a little bit of a hack, but it's a very quick way to kind of like show you what's going on within a prototype and where these values are is just throw a little text note on there and use that as a debug right live within your prototype. So cute trick. And um, over time, you'll see us uh, investing further in like making this debugging experience and understanding what's going on better. Amazing. Um, and actually, Garrett, I'll stay with you for the final, final question. The question that we get asked a lot um, is about the input fields. Can you tell us your thoughts on the input fields? Um, what, and what I mean by that too is like, uh, a lot of folks, and myself included, I think everybody at Figma included too, would love to be able to just type right into input fields, which we can't do right now. Can you talk about that real quick? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I do want to note right after uh, advanced prototyping launch, we did note that the community started filling up with people building very amazing um, duct tape together versions of input fields. And it definitely indicates a desire and a need for something more fully featured here. 
Um, it is actually something that we are thinking about and want to get to. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is make sure that the actual uh, the way that we build them and the way that um, you all get to use them makes sense and is a part of a system. So we're trying to do it right. Um, part of this is actually looking into making components a little bit better and behave um, behave more like these little objects within your prototypes to make those building blocks better. And from there, we can see a, uh, see a way to expand into more of these fully featured things like in the fields. So just want to know that it's on our radar. It's something we're thinking about and uh, we hope to hope to help it help you out uh, down the line. Amazing. Yeah, I know. I think it's always just really helpful to know like we're we we've got it on our brain. We're not ignoring you. We promise. Um, there's just so many things, so many things that are going on. And as I'm sure like a lot of you as product designers know, there's so many things you wish you could get to, but there's only so much, <laughs> there's so much you could do. Um, amazing. Cool. Okay. We have a few minutes left. I'm gonna wrap us up. I know there were so many questions that came in. Um, one thing that I want to share, let me share my screen again. Here we go. Cool. Um, some neat prototypes. I just go there was a couple that um I grabbed from our whole team here from Nico Garrett, Anna. Um one thing that I do a lot with prototypes is I go to the community because there are so many, uh, uh, Garrett referenced the community, I think, and I think everybody uh, referenced the community a little bit with our playgrounds, um, especially with prototyping. It's so helpful to see how other people have set things up. Um, and these two, I think, are just really fun ones. Uh, the Flipbook and the Figma Invaders. Um, totally check these ones out. Uh, these both have variables in it, but there's so many that don't have variables. But check out the Figma community. That is uh, right up over here, Figma community. Um, some more resources that we have for y'all. Prototyping resources. Um, there's a lot out there. I have this little compilation here. This is resources for getting started in Figma, but this specifically, and this is a community file that um, I think we're sharing right now. Um, this is a community file that has, uh, this section specifically has basically all of the Figma videos that we have put together. Videos, blog posts, uh, playground files, um, they are all right here. So definitely recommend checking that out. Um, also, one of our DA's designer advocates, Mal, has put together some really great resources right here. So we'll make sure we send that link as well. Um, and then just other resources in general, youtube.com slash Figma design. Um, it, I truly mean it when I say it, how I learned Figma was through the YouTube page. Oops, I can't say it. YouTube page. Um, and now I'm on the YouTube page, which is really weird. Um, but there are so many really great resources on there. This will be on our YouTube page. A lot of really great things that you can watch on there. Um, we talked about Figma community, especially our playgrounds. There's a lot of playgrounds. I think we have one on videos. We have one on advanced prototyping. Um, we have one on scrolling. We, there's a lot, especially for prototyping. Um, and then figma.com slash events also um, for any other ones that we have coming up. We add more all the time, lots of prototyping ones, lots in general. 